we go. Hey, how you doing, Doc? Good, how are you? It's nice to see you after so long. Nice to see you. Let's take a seat. All right, awesome. All right, Mr. Rico, uh, what seems to be the problem? All right, so I've noticed a few really weird things happening with me lately. So I've had trouble walking around campus lately. I'm losing my balance a lot. I'm tripping a lot. I just feel really clumsy. I don't know what's going on. Um, I've also noticed my posture. I can't really hold it for that long before it gives me any issues. Um, and along with that, I've had these really weird emotional outbursts where I either start laughing out of nowhere or almost get on the verge of crying. It's, I feel like I'm going insane. What's going on? So, based upon years of expertise in medical school, uh, I think you can have a few things. Um, could be Lyme disease, could be uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, could be polio, but not really polio because it's been extinct for a few years now. Um, and I think the most likely culprit is ALS. So, um, there's a few tests that we can try to see if it is ALS. Um, the two types of tests that, use, that are used to diagnose ALS are called electro myography, which is also known as EMG, or a nerve conduction study, which is also known as NCS. Um, so these tests uh, detect electrical energy in muscles and also detect the ability of nerves to sense signal respectively. Um, an EMG and an NCS can be used to support an ALS diagnosis and it also rules out peripheral neuropathy, which is peripheral nerve damage, um, and also rules out myopathy, which is muscle disease. Um, an MRI is not going to be used for this test for this uh, disease, the diagnosis of this disease, because these are really just like, the MRI is just kind of used to show if you if your symptoms are being caused by something else in your body, so say, you know, your pain is being caused by a herniated disc or a spinal cord tumor, that's what an MRI would show us, but it really wouldn't show us um, ALS, so we're not gonna end up using an MRI. But if you'd like, we can also request blood and urine samples, um, as well as a spinal fluid sample extracted via lumbar puncture, um, those would tell us um, what kind of enzymes and stuff are going through your body, if any of that is a concern, and we can also do a muscle biopsy that can also be used for well myopathy. But I think for now we're just going to go with an EMG and an NCS. That's good with you. Awesome. Sounds awesome. awesome. That's good. Get that, that done then. Gotcha. One eternity later. Hey there, Mr. Rico. Hey. So, unfortunately, I have to tell you that you do have ALS according to the tests. Okay, you've been talking about ALS, but what exactly is that? So ALS stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and it belongs to a group of diseases called motor neuron diseases. So essentially, it's a disease that attacks the nerve cells that are used in voluntary muscle actions, so things like moving your arms, moving your legs, moving your face muscles, that kind of thing. And um, through the progression of ALS, you know, motor neurons in the body degenerate and die, so that's kind of how you lose the ability to move and you know, those various body parts that are controlled by voluntary muscle actions. Um, with the death of the motor neuron, signals that are sent to the muscles seize, which causes a decrease in muscle stimulation and in turn causes a weakening of muscle fiber itself. Um, this disease is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, if you know the famous Yankee baseball player Lou Gehrig. Um, I actually know a lot about ALS, but not as much as two researchers who work at this hospital, so I'm going to let them take it over for you. Um, they'll hopefully tell you all you need to know if you just watch this quick little video right here. Awesome. Research has determined that there are numerous possible mechanisms resulting in sporadic and familial types of ALS, including excitotoxicity occurring after glutamate overexcitation, mitochondri mitochondrial damage, mutation in transcription of particular genes, RNA processing, apoptosis, and the release of toxins from astrocytes. Despite such research, no direct mechanism for ALS has been identified. Most investigators and clinicians agree that various factors, most likely in combination, lead to the development of the disease. ALS's most notable feature is the resulting axonal degeneration. Large motor neurons are affected by degeneration to a greater extent than smaller ones. This process occurs as a result of the death of the anterior horn cell body, leading to degeneration of the associated motor axon. As the axon breaks down, surrounding Schwann cells catabolize the axon's myelin sheath and engulf the axon, breaking it into fragments. In typical ALS patients, certain motor neurons are spread, spared until very late in the disease progression. These include numerous cranial nerves and central components of the spinal cord. It is important to note that making the distinction between the original onset of ALS and the pathophysiology of ALS matters because the mechanisms underlying each of these stages are thought to be different. This means that interfering with the mechanisms to prevent the disease and mechanisms to slow the progression of onset 
likely require different approaches. ALS does not appear to start at birth, and there is a great variability in the age of onset, even within familial onset. ALS progression is noted with distinct changes in physiology. Early in the disease, surviving nerve fibers establish connections and re-innervate motor units that have lost their connection to axons that have already died. As a result, large motor units are formed. These large motor units manifest in histological stains as fiber type groupings. Later in the disease, when the motor neurons that supply the large motor units die, group atrophy ensues. As the motor units grow larger and decrease in number, muscle fatigue will begin to arise. As the number of motor units innervating a muscle decrease further, reinnervation can no longer keep up with denervation, permanent weakness develops and progresses, and the effective muscle gradually atrophy. All right, so how far along in the disease am I? So um, in terms of the disease, you are um, a little far along. Um, the, most, the life expectancy of most people with ALS is around two to five years. So um, if that changes anything for you, um, they also, um, it doesn't affect your lateral bowel movement, but you know, it does affect things like your breathing and your, um, your arms and your legs and that kind of thing. Um, over time, you may or may not develop eating problems and that might lead to your malnutrition and dehydration. So what a lot of people do is they get IV injections and tracheotomies so they can breathe easier and so they can get the nutrition that they need. And a lot of people also um, suffer from memory and making like memory problems and making decisions. And so that leads to a form of dementia that we like to call frontotemporal dementia. And you already hit this stage, but it's called emotional lability. And that's when you're very volatile in terms of your rear motion. So you said you were crying and you're laughing. That kind of thing is a very, very um, trademark symbol for ALS. So are there any cures or treatments that I can take advantage of? So there are no cures, but there are treatment options. Um, there is a drug that inhibits, um, that decreases the release of um, glutamate. Um, that's called Reluzol. Um, you can get that, it's FDA approved. And other treatments for ALS just basically consist of treating your symptoms. Um, it's the best that we can do at this time. Gotcha. But there is research being done, if you want to check it out. Um, it's very interesting, actually, they just found a new gene. Gotcha. Since the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, there have been many discoveries in the research of ALS. $77 million was dedicated to research advancing the search for treatments and a cure. In just two years, three new genes were discovered. Researchers at Oregon State University have essentially stopped the progression of ALS in one type of mouse model used to study the disease. Since ALS is known to be caused by the death and deterioration of motor neurons in the spinal cord, it has been linked to mutations in copper. Copper ATSM is a known compound that helps deliver copper specifically to cells with damaged mitochondria and reaches the spinal cord where it's needed to treat ALS. This compound has low toxicity toxicity, easily penetrates the blood-brain barrier, is already used in human medicine at much lower doses for some purposes. Copper helps to stabilize superoxide dismutase, or SOD, an antioxidant protein whose proper function is essential to life. But when it lacks its metal cofactors, SOD can unfold and become toxic, toxic leading to the death of motor neurons. Expansion of the C9ORF72 gene is the most common genetic cause of familial ALS. The expansion results in the production of unusual dipeptide repeat proteins, or DPRs. The study goal was to understand how DPRs are toxic to motor neurons. To carry out their studies, researchers used induced pluripotent stem cells derived from healthy people and from people living with ALS. The investigators found that DPRs compromise mitochondrial function. DPRs also increase oxidative stress, which is a type of cell stress caused by the accumulation of destructive molecules called free radicals. Both lead to DNA damage. Overall, this suggests that DNA damage is a disease mechanism for C9ORF72-associated ALS. Knowing this, drugs that reduce DNA damage can be developed. Researchers will continue to study the detailed means by which DPR proteins compromise mitochondrial function and cause DNA damage. All right, awesome. Thank you, Doc. Absolutely. You have a good one, sir. Thank you, too.